guess now that Jason is here too, we can get started. <laughs> okay, today we'll continue the execution models. Uh, and this will probably be our last lecture on execution models, although it depends on how, uh, how fast we go. And feel free to ask questions. Remember, we left off at GPUs. I was rushing through GPUs last time. I'll cover that a little bit more today. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a brief overview of the GPUs that we covered last time. This is an important topic. And hopefully by the end of last time even, uh, you know that GPUs are not really that different from traditional SIMD architectures, except uh, in the sense, uh, except uh, in terms of what is exposed to the programmer. Right? So if you know the basic concepts of SIMD execution, single instruction, multiple data, that's what GPUs are. Okay, I guess let's cover some things first. Uh, lab assignment four, you know that that's due March 22nd, and I know some of you have started, and few of you have completed, but uh, please start if you haven't started. The danger bells are ringing <laughs> if you haven't started. And this should be fun. You'll do global and hybrid branch predictors, and you're going to do the extra credit, hopefully. I'd like everyone to participate in the extra credit. This is fun. And I'll show you some results. Well, I guess this is lab three great distribution. Mm, it's kind of a weird distribution, right? <laughs> there are a bunch here. Uh, and I'd like you guys to pull it up, hopefully. Uh, and I'll give you a chance to do that. But there are quite a few of you who did quite well. Uh, I believe 11 or 12 people around that uh, got, per got a perfect score. Uh, on lab three. The average was 62. So this is a little bit different from lab one and lab two. So labs are getting harder, as you can see. And lab four uh, will be easier if you've done well on this lab, I, I believe. But if you haven't done well on this lab, lab four will be hard. Okay. And if you're around here, definitely talk with us, talk with the TAs. Uh, performance competition, we did have a performance competition, and several of you submitted the extra credit. And some of you will get prizes, although I've been very busy, so I couldn't get you prizes yet. But I'll announce uh, the winners here. Uh, there was a thousand instruction test case which Justin generated, I believe. So you can blame him for the idiosyncrasies of the test case. He, he wanted to test your designs thoroughly. And uh, five extra credit submissions result in the correct output. And I'd like to recognize people who are here. Is Albert here? I guess not. So he misses the recognition. <laughs> so that's the execution time for him. Third place, uh, there are two students, Joseph and Xiao. None of, the, none of you are here? Well, Joseph is in the back, that's right, yeah. You're too far. <laughs> but Xiao is not here. Uh, you, you guys got tied. I hope you didn't have, submit the same assignment. <laughs> I doubt it, but Martin is number two. Well, he's not here also. Andrew is here, so he, he was number one. <laughs> By, I don't know, 100 nanoseconds? Did you test this correctly? <laughs> this, is, this is within the error range. <laughs> okay, but congratulations to those of you who participated. These four, four of these, actually this is also within 100 nanoseconds of the next one, right? So you guys did pretty well. I don't know how, there's a big jump between these two. So maybe you can optimize your design better, Albert. OK, so these people will get prizes. And lab two extra credit, I don't think we recognize Andrew Pfeiffer, who actually did the extra credit for lab two. He did a working microprogram MIPS design. And if you're interested in how he did it, you can talk with him. OK, so one thing I would like to announce is the late, late day policy. I realized many of you have used late days, and many of you are out of late days. And I'd like to be, and I'd like you to do, uh, do the work and learn the material instead of penalizing you for using the late day. So I'd like to make an adjustment to the late day policy that we announced earlier. I'd like you to keep submitting the labs, even if you've used all of your late days, and some of you have. Uh, so the policy will be adjusted as follows. Everyone gets five additional late days for future labs, starting from lab four. This includes lab four. Uh, and a little bit more lenient. I'd like you to do the labs and learn the material. Each late day beyond all exhausted late days costs you 15% of the full credit 
of the lab. So if you haven't used any late days so far, basically what you have is 10 late days for the remaining labs. And beyond that, if you want to use more late days, you'll get 15% off. Make sense? So the purpose of this is to ensure that you do the labs and you learn the material. Is everybody happy with this? Any, any objections? OK, good. <laughs> Basically, do the labs and learn, learn the material while I figure out how to drink my coffee. <laughs> OK, uh, and also, well, yeah, if you're having difficulties with the labs, hopefully this policy will help. Uh, but uh, attend the lab sessions and get help from the TAs. And if you would like to submit lab three and get a regrade, I'm open to this also. Please let me know if you would like to do that. Again, the, po the purpose is for you to learn the labs. And those of you who are doing well, you're doing well anyway. So you, your, your, your grade will not be affected by any of this. So there's no fairness issue related to this. OK? So even if you're late, learn the material. OK, this is homework three. This looks a little bit better than lab three, I believe, I guess. Homeworks are easier than the labs, is that true? OK. Well, that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> labs are supposed to be designed, right? That's, uh, you, you design the material in the real world, world too. But that's, you, you will, uh, do we have these homeworks to be distributed today, or do, will we have them on Friday? Oh, we should, oh, Jungo, we should have them today. OK, maybe later today uh, if Jungo is awake. If not, you'll get them on Friday. OK, homework five will be assigned later today. This will be due April 1st, and uh, we'll cover concepts we haven't covered so far in homeworks. Uh, SIMD, caching, virtual memory, and some other things. OK, and there will be a recitation session this Friday, uh, which will cover midterm one solutions and anything else you would like to cover. OK, and these are the readings for next week that uh, we've already talked about in the last lecture. And last lecture, yeah, yes? I was going to ask, when will the uh, grades for lab three be posted? Uh, oh, they're not posted yet? OK. Uh, I guess today, sometime today, basically. <laughs> I guess you see the distribution, but you don't know where you are now, right? <laughs> Unless you're one of the five extra credit submitters. OK. Last lecture, we covered SIMD processing and started with GPU fundamentals. Today, we're going to wrap up GPUs, talk about VLIW a little bit. And if time permits, I'd like to talk about some other uh, execution models, decoupled access execute and systolic arrays. And if time really permits, I'd like to go into static scheduling a little bit, which does affect some of the other execution models like VLIW and decoupled access execute. We did talk about static scheduling a little bit, but we didn't go into too much detail. Okay, these were the approaches to instruction level concurrency. Again, this is for your uh, caches to get warmed up. We were talking about SIMD processing. And let's continue that. GPUs are an example of SIMD processing, except SIMD is not exposed to the programmer. The programming model is uh, more like SIMT, as NVIDIA called it, single instruction, multiple thread. The programmer uses threads to program, and the hardware dynamically merges those threads in a SIMD manner. And if you remember, this was a high-level overview of a GPU. We were concerned with this SIMD execution in a shader core. Basically, that's the core. That's the processor. Uh, and you remember the idea of a warp, right? Uh, I believe AMD calls this, or ATI used to call this, wavefront. Right? This is the same thing as a warp. Uh, basically, you have a bunch of scalar threads that have a common PC, and they execute together. They're grouped together. Uh, and they execute the same instruction on different data elements. All threads basically run the same kernel. And this is one example, loop iteration. This loop iteration can be a thread itself. And you can think of these as iterations, or you can think of these as threads. So you have the same thread executed by, uh, execute, that executes on multiple different data elements. Right? That's the idea of a thread. So when you program a GPU, you basically program this thread. And you need to partition the data across those threads, obviously. These threads are operating on different iterations if you look at the scalar code, which means that they're actually operating on different data elements, right? Each iteration operates on different data elements. And assuming you can, you can give each thread one data element, right? 
and that will uh, be, give you n threads in this case. Or you could partition your data such that each thread operates on maybe m data elements, like let's say a thousand, which means that each thread actually does uh, a thousand of these iterations. Make sense? That way you have n divided by m threads. Of course you need to partition your data such that each thread operates uh, on its own n divided by m data. And this is one example of how you can partition the data. This is just a pictorial example, right? You could imagine how you do that over here. And this is kind of like a code example. Again, this is simplified. You cannot run this on a GPU today. Uh, CUDA is NVIDIA's programming model. But basically, the, this is to show you that the programming model is very simple, right? You're adding two arrays here. And uh, the uh, CUDA code is very similar to the scalar code. You have threads, except you have some partitioned data here. You do the data partitioning. You divide the data into blocks and each thread operates on part of the block. And basically, this is how you program it. The thread uh, adds its own portion of these two arrays and stores the result back to its own portion of, those, of, that, of the resulting array. That's it. So a little bit different from CPU, but it's not too much different. There is no vector instruction, as you can see this. Right? And this is the more complex version, if you really would like to know uh, how it works. And you can, you can figure this out on your own. Uh, the goal of, of this class is not to teach GPU programming, but to, see, but to uh, enable you to understand what it, what it looks like, what, is, what does the architecture look like, and how you could program it. Uh, or what, the, what is exposed to the programmer. So what is exposed to the programmer is essentially a thread here. Right? OK, so we've covered this. I'm not going to go into this in detail again. But because you have so many threads, in a graphics engine, uh, the, the engine is designed in such a way that uh, it's fine-grained multi-threaded across these warps. So each warp has some number of threads. And at any given point in time in the pipeline, you have uh, one instruction from that warp. Right? And remember, each thread in the warp executes the same instruction. So this is a very regular engine. You have a SIMD pipeline. You fetch. Let's say you're fetching from thread warp 7 here. Uh, you're fetching a common instruction for all of the threads. Let's say 32 threads. So fetch is amortized across those threads. Decode is amortized. And then you access the register file. It's a SIMD access. So you access different elements. Each, each thread accesses a different element in the register file. And then they execute together. And uh, if this is a data cache access, if one of the threads in the warp misses, that warp is taken out of the pipeline, and it's wait, it waits for the memory to come back. And in the meantime, other warps keep executing, because this is fine-grained multi-thread across thread warps. That's how you can hide latency. That's how you can keep the pipeline simple. Which means that, again, because you, uh, we're doing fine-grained multi-threading, you don't need to do branch prediction right, for each thread warp. OK. And there's no data dependency checking within a thread as well. OK, so uh, basically, I've covered this also. This, this makes life easier for the programmer, right? Uh, traditional SIMD uh, requires programmer to basically deal with vector length, for, vector length, for example. Whereas with warp-based warp SIMD, SIMD, you don't need to be lockstep, for example. That's one example. You can take out threads. The hardware, hardware has the flexibility to schedule these threads as it wants. In fact, uh, it can dynamically figure out which threads are executing the same instruction and put those together, as we will see in a couple of slides. Whereas in SIMD, it's very inflexible, right? If you think about that, you need to specify the vector length, and that instruction needs to operate on those data elements. Here, you can move, move, move threads around. And let's see how that, how that happens. Uh, basically, each thread can be treated individually. That's what I was saying. Programming not model is not SIMD. And software doesn't need to know the vector length. And we will see how this enables some branch latency tolerance. So ISA is scalar. That's what this means. Vector instructions are formed dynamically, if you want to think of those as instructions. They're not really instructions because they're not really exposed to the programmer. And I've covered this. I'm not going to go into this again. Uh, I think 
You'll, you guys can study this. This is, uh, actually, I'll say one thing. This is a programming model, single pro procedure, multiple data. And you can think of this, uh, basically, this iteration or multiple of these iterations as a procedure. Right? And people used to uh, program, uh, do parallel programming. If you want to parallelize this code on a MIMD machine, multiple instruction, multiple data, multiple uh, multiprocessor, basically, you would do the same thing. You just divide. Uh, this loop into iterations and bundle a bunch of iterations and generate a thread that executes those iterations and they execute on separate processors. That's essentially what you're doing with a GPU, except the GPU is hidden from the programmer, putting together those threads that happen to execute the same instruction and amortizing the cost of fetch, decode, and other things that can be done together uh, for the same thread. Uh, for, for the threads that execute the same instruction. Make sense? OK. So we've, we've, we've already covered this. That's why I'm going a little bit fast. Uh, so if you, if you have any questions, just let me know, or we can talk about it later. OK. So let's take a look at a particular issue that uh, the GPUs handle for the programmer relatively easily which is the branch divergence problem. Well, it's also a problem in GPUs, but it's, uh, it's also one benefit of the GPUs. So if you look at this code, this is very branchy, right? Uh, and SIMD, traditional SIMD, is not very good at with this kind of branchy code because you have lots of ifs and else's, which means that the threads are not doing the same thing, right? You're, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're operating on many data elements, uh, you're not doing the same thing on many data elements, assuming that you would like to, uh, this, assuming that some, uh, some threads go this way and some threads go that way. Does that make sense? This is your control flow graph. So let's, let's take a look at what threads would be doing. Let's say a thread one goes this way, thread two takes that path, thread three takes this path, and thread four takes this path, and they have this common PC Initially, they start with the common PC. They diverge at some point. Right? Now, imagine how you would program this with a SIMD programming model where you have SIMD instructions. It's actually tough. You need to do a lot of masking, right? Remember the masking, vector masks? You need to do that predication as a programmer, basically. And that's a tough thing to do. It's not easy. I'm not going to go into the code, but you can imagine what you need to do here. When you get to this branch, you basically change the mat vector mask register. Right? And you, you basically test for that uh, condition, set the vector mask register, and execute a SIMD instruction with that mask. And then change the vector mask register every time you come to a branch, basically, and execute a SIMD instruction. That's very tough. Whereas with a GPU, it's very easy. You don't need to deal with all of any of those masks. What you do is, this is your thread. You just write the code with ifs and else's, branches. And all of the threads are the same, essentially, in terms of the code they execute. And initially, all of the threads start at this point with a common PC. And when, when, the th when, when each thread executes the branch, GPU automatically handles how that branch is executed. So the programmer doesn't need to deal with it at all. That's the big benefit of GPUs over. SIMD execution. And let's see how the GPU actually does that. So keep in mind that threads initially start from the same program counter, and they execute the same code. And let's simplify this. Uh, you have this branch, and let's, uh, let's make it a little bit more simplified also. Assume that these are the threads, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight threads within a warp. They all execute the same program counter. They all get to the branch. At this branch, they execute the branch, they, except on different data elements. And it so happens that some of them need to take path A. Right? In this case, GPU automatically figures out which ones need to take path A and executes only those threads in path A. So what, this is what the GPU does. And GPU also remembers that the other threads should execute path B. And the next cycle, it executes these threads that need to execute path B within the same warp. And GPU figures out when the threads actually merge, 
which means that they no longer need to continue on different paths. And it keeps, it merges those threads at the same reconvergence PC here. And it continues with the full warp of the threads. Make sense? This the underlying hardware does this. The programmer doesn't need to deal with this at all. All the programmer does is write this thread code. So it's beautiful in a sense, right? We might do it. That's why GPUs have been a, a lot more successful than traditional SIMD machines, because they don't, exp they don't make life harder for the programmer. OK, so let's see how the GPU does this, actually. Uh, remember, this is the same example. Basically, uh, you have this thread warp, and you have, for a given warp, you have a stack of execution. And the stack tells which threads are currently active and what is the next program counter for that warp. So in this case, when the threads in this particular warp start out, next program counter is A, and they are all executing the same instruction. Active mask means should the threads actually execute that instruction. And all threads execute this instruction because there's no divergence here, right? They haven't diverged. Now let's say they executed that branch instruction here. This is another pictorial view. Let's assume that all of the threads actually took this path. In this case, everything is fine. The threads continue together. And you have the same active mask because they all need to execute B. So next PC is B. Let's assume that next uh, that, that instruction is also executed by the four threads. Now what happens is, uh, assume that some threads, threads 0 and 3, branch this way, and threads, zero, uh, threads 1 and 2 branch this way. So the GPU automatically creates two things. One is, uh, for the threads that go this way, next PC should be D, and pushes them on this stack and its active mask will be 0, 1, 1, 0. Well, I guess I made a mistake. For threads that go this way, not this way, it pushes uh, some, an entry onto the stack with the active mask 0, 1, 1, 0, saying that threads 1 and 2 should execute from next PC D. And also, there is reconvergence PC E that's actually generated by the compiler. The compiler tells the GPU that these threads, when you take this branch, the reconvergence PC should be E. Make sense? So the programmer doesn't need to deal with that also. So two things are pushed on the stack. One is the active mask for the threads that go this way, and the other is the active mask for the threads that go this way. So you see the difference. Next PC is D and C for those. And then in the next cycle, the next time this warp comes back to execute, what the GPU does is it takes the next PC from the top of stack fetches from there for the active mask and executes the instructions for the threads that are specified by the active mask. So if you look at the execution, only threads 0 and 3 execute that instruction. And how it's implemented in the underlying hardware, you can still fetch from the other threads, but basically you don't write into the register file, right? Because they're not supposed to execute instruction C. And in the next cycle, well, now what happened to this set of threads is next program counter became E, right? When you execute the set of threads, they calculate the next program counter, and next program counter is E, which is the same as the top of stack, which means that the GPU now can take that off the stack. These warps actually have come to the reconvergence PC. And in the next cycle, the GPU takes this, the remaining threads in the active mask and executes them, OK? So this way, you execute one path first and the other path next. And at the end of this execution, the hardware figures out that you've actually reached the reconvergence point. Right. And now you can continue with the full active mask, because that was what you had in the stack. So it's stack-based execution that, uh, that governs which threads go where. And in the next cycle, next, next PC is G. Now you can imagine what happens with a more complex control flow graph also, right? We didn't have to reconverge here. We could have reconverged there. But because we have a stack, we, we can always come back to the reconvergence point for each thread. It's kind of nice, right? So what we've done essentially is, uh, I'll call this dynamic predicated execution, right? 
what happened is you have predicated execution, basically. Here, you have a bunch of threads, four threads, and only some of them are supposed to execute this particular instruction here. And the predicate is determined based on this branch here. And these two threads happen to have their predicates false. And what the GPU did was uh, it executed this path with the predicates false for threads one and two. And the next cycle, once those threads are done with their path, uh, GPU executed the other threads that had their predicates true for, that, uh, for, for the same condition. OK? So you all know predicate execution. This is uh, here, uh, hardware does the predicate execution. The software, all the software needs to do is to provide the reconvergence point. Right? That helps the dynamic predicate execution a lot. I'll let you imagine what would happen if the hardware needed to figure out that reconvergence point. That would be very, very tough. Make sense? The software marks for each branch what is the reconvergence point, which means that you've got to be careful in writing code, right? If you actually don't have reconvergence points in your branches, then the compiler may not be able to analyze that code. OK. This is the same thing, again, for your benefit. I'll skip through this, but this is uh, another animation. OK, so now, th now we've, seen that, uh, we've seen the possibility of merging these threads. You can actually uh, imagine other things, right? Uh, these threads uh, come from a bigger set of threads. Right? Remember what we were? Uh, discussing, you have a big matrix, right? Let's say it's 1 million by 1 million. And you're doing some operation on that matrix. You, what, uh, and uh, a warp consists of 32 threads. And let's assume that you actually have, uh, I don't know, what should we say, 1 million threads. This means that you really have 1 million divided by 32 warps in your machine, right? I don't know what that amounts to. Is that 2 to the 20 divided by 2 to the 5? Yeah, 2 to the 15. That's 32,000 warps, right? That's a lot. <laughs> now, even though within a warp, threads may diverge, because we have so many other warps, they may be executing the same instruction, right? This warp may be at program counter x. This other warp may be at program counter x also. Because these threads are actually executing the same code, you can move this warp, uh, we can move this thread from this warp to this warp. Right? So hardware has that flexibility now. Does that make sense? Let's take a look at that. Uh, this may require some thinking. But basically, you can dynamically merge threads executing the same instruction if you have the hardware to figure this out. Uh, so let's take a look at this. Uh, you can form a new warp at divergence. This is one example. Let's assume that the hardware figured out that these threads, uh, this warp is at PCX. And this warp is at PCX also. Assuming that these are part of the same program, what the hardware can do is form a new warp that contains these two warps. And now you have a single warp instead of two warps. If you execute this one, you don't fully utilize your machine, right? You execute only one, two, three, four instructions. If you execute this one, you, execute, you, you again don't fully utilize your machine. But if you merge these two warps, you have one, two, three, four, five, seven instructions. So you get much better efficiency by merging these two warps. Make sense? Well, this is, a, this is a great example, of course, because it turns out that these threads happen to align, right? And why would you want to align them? Uh, like, why can't you move, take this thread and move it over here? Because remember the SIMD picture that I had a couple of lectures ago? The register file is partitioned such that the register that you're accessing 
is on the lane you're assigned to. And GPUs preserve the same beautiful partitioning. If you take this and move it here, now it needs to be able to access the register that's on this lane in hardware. And GPUs don't have support for that kind of access. So just like a SIMD machine. Think of these as lanes. A thread is executing in this lane. A thread is executing in this lane. OK? So this is beautiful because now you can actually fully utilize a single warp by merging two warps. Well, not fully. I guess 7 eighths utilize the warp. In this case, it's tougher, right? You can merge some of these threads uh, across these two warps, but not, some of, not, not all of them. For example, these two cannot merge because there's already a thread executing in this warp, even though they're at the same PC. But if you have a third one, now you can merge these three things together. Right? Assume that these are all at the same program counter. You can reduce three warps into two warps and improve your execution time. Make sense? OK, so let's take a look at how this happens. And if you're interested in this, this is the paper that describes it. And as far as I know, many GPUs today employ something like this. Maybe not exactly the same way, but the, uh, at an ideal level, they try to merge these warps that happen to execute at the same program counter. OK, that's the idea. So let's take a look at uh, the same example that we saw before, except with two warps. You have uh, these warps starting at program counter, that program counter. And they branch. And some of them take path A. Now let's take a look at another set of warps that are fine-grained multi-threaded, uh, another set of threads, another warp that's fine-grained multi-threaded with this warp. This warp also executes at this program counter. It's interleaved. And then the threads in this warp also branch. And some of them happen to go this way. Now what the hardware can do is it can merge these two warps that happen to take path A. And what you would get is something like this. In this case, we didn't reduce the number of warps. OK? Yes, you have a question. Wouldn't this possibly introduce deadlocks? Deadlocks. Because um, threads within the warp are, on, are in lockstep, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, but warps themselves are not in lockstep. So if the, if the program knows this and tries to avoid, say, deadlocks within the warp itself by scheduling some type of barrier across warps but not within them, that's a good question. And then you reschedule the threads so that dependent threads from different wars end up in one war. So you cannot do this across barriers. Yeah. OK. That's, that's the, I, I didn't get to that, but that's a very good observation. You cannot do this across barriers. OK. So let's take a look at uh, a more complicated example. That actu uh, Actually, I'll let you go through this example. But this, uh, this gives you the benefit of the mechanism. I guess this is automatically doing it. So you can, you can see what the warps are doing here. This is the baseline. In the baseline, you see a lot of divergence. And you see a lot of warps that are not fully utilized. For example, this, uh, initially, you have these two warps that start at program counter A. And they're fully utilized. And they diverge. Uh, uh, in, the, in the blue warp, three of the threads go, go and execute B. One of the threads go and uh, goes and executes C. In the red warp, I guess it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's even worse. Two of the threads go and execute B, and some of them actually execute D later on, and some, some of them will execute F later on. So you get a lot of divergence. And that branch divergence leads to a lot of the warps not fully utilizing the machine. You see here, the machine with is really four uh, operations, but there's only one thread that's actually executing in the ALU. And all of the others are kind of no-ops, because it's predicated. But if you look at dynamic warp formation, what you can now do is, for those warps that are executing the same instruction, B, C, these two warps, for example, you can merge. D, these two warps you can merge. E, these two warps you can merge, but you, you will still have two warps, because these happen to be on the same lane. F, they, you can merge these two. And these are full anyway. So basically, a new warp is created from scalar threads of both the blue warp and the red warp executing at the same basic block. And this is the result. Oh, 
Well, I guess I've already told you how to merge, right? If you merge the warps that are at B, this is what you will get. You'll get two warps. One of them is fully utilized. One of them is not very utilized. But if you had another warp, perhaps you would fully utilize this one also. And you do have another warp. This is just a simplified example, right? C, now you've reduced one of the warps. D, you've reduced one of the warps. And eventually, you will save cycles. And that's the number of saved cycles, basically, in this example. You'll save three cycles. OK? So that's the idea. And the, uh, this, you can do this because the programming model is flexible. You have these threads, and the underlying hardware can now take advantage of the, of the fact that they're executing the same instruction. OK. This is something I will not go into, but uh, a similar thing happens with memory divergence also. If you think about it, uh, what do I mean by memory divergence? This is the branch divergence problem. Bra uh, the warps di uh, threads within the same warp diverge at the same branch. But if you think about a load instruction, a similar thing happens. Uh, you have a cache access with a load. And let's assume that you have 32 threads. that are, They're all accessing the cache. If one of the threads misses in the cache, it stalls the entire warp. But what you can do is you can remove that thread that missed in the cache, assign it to some other warp, and assign a thread that's hit in the cache to this warp. Right? Now you can keep executing. That's the idea. I'm not going into detail on how to do this, and this is a little bit harder. But the problem we're solving is one thread in a warp can stall the entire warp if it misses in the cache. Ideally, you would like either all the threads in the warp to miss in the cache, or none of them. That way, you, you, you don't lose any efficiency. Right? So what you can do is you can actually combine threads such that to ensure that. It's a more difficult problem. And the solu solutions to this are actually more researchy at this point. Uh, it's not clear how to do this perfectly, because if you merge threads uh, from uh, coming from, uh, if you merge threads coming from different warps that are stalled due to memory, you can mess up your bank conflicts, right? Because a programmer, hopefully, put these, warp, put these threads together in a warp such that they actually access memory without bank conflicts. So if you do this merging, you can increase your bank conflicts. Actually, this problem happens with the branch divergence, too. If the hardware does this merging aggressively without caring about bank conflicts, you can increase bank conflicts while improving your SIMD efficiency. And this has been shown in, uh, shown in papers. OK. But I'd like you to be aware of this problem also. Uh, basically, uh, there's, there's need for more research, and companies are doing this, to tolerate uh, memory divergence, to keep the warps. Basically, the, the, the goal is to ensure that the, key, the warps are doing the same thing. Right? That's what you would like to do, either hitting the cache or missing in the cache. And somehow handle this branch divergence as well as memory divergence, load, hit, miss, together. Any questions? This is actually a very fun research topic if you're excited about going into this. Uh, and you will need to, if you want to do, uh, get the best performance out of GPUs, you will need to understand what happens underneath. It's very tough to get great performance if you don't understand what happens with branch divergence. So branch divergence is easy if you're, pro you don't need to worry about this if your program is really regular. But if you want to use the GPUs for irregular programs, which is what a lot of people are excited about today, because you have so much processing power, but you would like to enable that processing power for programs that have this kind of behavior. Right? And if you understand how the underlying, underlying hardware schedules these warps and threads, you can, you can get a lot higher performance for a program like this. OK. I guess I'll give you just one example of, uh, I guess this is a very old example. How old is this now? <laughs> very old, yeah. These are slides from K1. If you want the new examples, you can take K1's course. <laughs> he, has, he probably has much newer slides, right? Uh, so this is uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 285. And NVIDIA 
says they have 240 stream processors, but you don't necessarily need to believe them. This is actually SIMT execution. What you really have is 30 cores and eight SIMD functional units per core. I guess calling a functional unit a processor is a little bit overreaching. But <laughs> so uh, what does it look like? Basically, this is what a core looks like. Uh, you have uh, a common portion where the threads are decoded and fetched because they happen to use the same program counter. Uh, they fetch from the same program counter. And then you have uh, eight execution units. This is the SIMD functional unit. Right? And this is what I would call a core because uh, threads, uh, threads within this core execute the same instruction. Right? And they have multiply add and multiply functional units as part of their SIMD unit. And I guess you need to provide execution context storage to enable the execution of all those, all those threads. This is something we did not talk about. But again, this is very fundamental to multi-threading, right? As long as you have many threads, you need to provide the contexts, which is the register file for those threads. And you can see how big it is, right? It's 64 kilobyte of storage for contexts. Same problem exists in fine-grained multi-threaded machines. Any kind of multi-threading, you need to provide the registers. And that's the cost. OK. Uh, well, I guess we've talked about this. Groups of 32 threads share the instruction stream. And up to 32 warps are simultaneously interleaved within this core. So that's the fine-grained multi-threading. 32 warps execute in a fine-grained multi-thread manner, which means that you have 1,024 thread context. And that's where the hardware cost comes from, right? within a single core. And the entire machine has 30 of these cores, which means that you have 30 thousand threads. Right. That's a very parallel machine, right? Except you enable this parallelism because you exploit the fact that they're executing the same instruction within a core. Okay? Okay, any questions on GPUs? How many of you have programmed GPUs? Only two? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess there is no programming course uh, that is required, right? There is? No, right, yeah, that's right. But the optional, I believe you can take 418, uh, that's uh, in the CS department, and do GPU programming. I have a question. Yes. So like both CIMD and GPUs, they focus on throughput instead of on turnaround. But if you want to do this massively parallel things, and you want to also focus on like the turnaround time of each individual thread. Mm -hmm. How you do it? Well, uh, basically, you want to reduce the latency of executing each thread, right? First of all, fine-grained multi-threading is not good for that right. to begin with. Right? If you really care about a thread, then you should get rid of fine-grained multi-threading. But that does reduce the uh, that does increase your hardware cost. But is there a way to be able to switch between the two focus? Like I see. I'm thinking like, for example, you could have a critical section that whenever you hit this section, you just want to get, the, get it past as fast as possible. I see. Now you're, you're getting into more research issues, uh, which, is, which we will get to hopefully. But you can exploit again the idea of heterogeneity there, right? These, these are very homogeneous machines. If you look at this, this is very, very regular, right? It's very homogeneous. But if you want. Uh, this is for throughput, and if you actually want to get out of the a code section really fast, which is what a critical section is. Critical section, uh, what is a critical section? Basically, it's a section that can be executed by only one thread at a given time. It serializes all of the threads. And if there are threads that are waiting to access a lock, for example, that's protecting some shared data, then those threads are serialized. You would like the thread that's keeping other threads waiting to execute very, very quickly. But if it's executing in a fine-grained multi-thread manner, it'll take a long time. So I think what Jiao is suggesting is to have something else on the side, perhaps, that can execute that thread really fast. And in order to be able to do that, you need to exploit heterogeneity, right? Or at least some sort of heterogeneity, perhaps. So maybe. 
This is just one example, and we'll get to this. Uh, maybe you have this regular unit that executes like SIMT. And when this regular unit detects that a thread gets to a critical section, it can ship that thread to a faster serial engine, which perhaps does out of order execution, right? That could be a possibility. Now you have two engines. One is optimized for latency, how fast you can execute a single thread, or optimized for single thread performance. And the other is optimized for throughput. It's optimized for parallel performance, not serial performance. And when you need serial performance, you take the thread and ship it to this serial engine that uses many of the techniques that we've discussed to improve single thread performance. And once it's done with that critical section, you place it back in its warp. That's one possibility. And we did not do exactly this, but I'll, I'll uh, give you a paper if you're interested in this by Arthur Suleiman at all. The idea is accelerating critical sections section execution using asymmetric multi-core architectures. And asymmetry and heterogeneity are the same thing. This is in a conference that's it has a long name, Architectural Support for Programming Languages and Operating Systems in 2009. And that is a very similar idea, basically. Not on a GPU, but if uh, you have a multi-core machine, part of it is optimized for parallel performance, which means that you have many small cores. I'll call this many small or wimpy cores that have terrible serial performance, single thread performance, but that, that have great parallel performance collectively. And you have another big core here that's optimized for serial performance. It uses all of those techniques, heavy out of order execution, super scalar processing to optimize to maximize single thread performance. And when one of these threads that is executing here gets to a critical section that would serialize other threads, the hardware automatically ships that thread to this big core such that that thread can get out of that section quickly so that other threads do not wait as long. That's the idea. And you could do this by using the idea of asymmetry or heterogeneity. And actually, many machines today are going to, toward this path, including NVIDIA's machines. But one, one example, one clear example of this is ARM's uh, big little architecture, right? I don't know how they did this. Yeah, they did this this way, right? Big dot little. So they have a big core, and they have few of them. That's why this big is small. And they have many little cores. Well, in their current incarnation, I think it's one through one to four. But if you think of scaling into the future, this could be two, and this could be a million, maybe, right? Or a thousand. So that's the idea. They do not use it, as far as I know, uh, for accelerating critical section execution like this. But it's not hard to imagine that it could be used that way, right? They do use it for another purpose, which is energy efficiency. In parallel parts of the code, you're much more energy efficient with a little course. In serial part of the parts of the code, you're probably more efficient uh, with, the, uh, with the big core. And I don't know their exact policies as to how they uh, achieve energy efficiency. But uh, the bigger idea here is you can get the best of both worlds by employing a heterogeneous substrate. If you want latency, use a core that's optimized for latency. If you want throughput, 
use a collection of cores that's optimized for throughput. If you want something else, maybe you have another heterogeneous substrate, right? Maybe you have something like a, re a reconfigurable logic, right, on the side. And if you detect a code section that keeps repeating, maybe you reconfigure this logic such that you get a lot more energy efficiency as well as high performance out of that code section. Right. So that's the idea. OK. So I think we've covered something else that we didn't intend to, but this is an important idea going forward in computer systems, exploiting heterogeneity. And I encourage you to think about this more. If you're interested, I'd be happy to talk more. And Justin will put up this paper probably, or Jungo will put up this paper. So Jungo is awake. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> OK. Well, let's move on to uh, VLIW, uh, unless there are any other questions. OK. We could actually have an entire lecture on heterogeneity. And if you have time later in the t semester, uh, and if you actually uh, ask me hard enough, maybe, maybe we'll have a lecture. <laughs> OK, uh, remember uh, uh, this classification? I've uh, given you this slide a few lectures ago. It feels like almost a month ago. But uh, this is Mike Flynn's classification of computers. Single instruction, single data, single instruction, multiple data, MISD and MIMD. Uh, we focused a lot on SIMD in the last lecture. Let's go back to SISD a little bit. Uh, we've already seen some parallelism extraction techniques from uh, the single instruction, single data paradigm, which is a scalar execution, right? Sequential execution is usually scalar. Uh, and superscalar and out of order execution concepts try to extract parallelism. We already talked about VLIW, and I'll go, I'd like to go into a little bit uh, more detail on this. We haven't talked about decoupled access execute. These are simpler ways of extracting parallelism out of a single instruction stream that operates on single data elements. So what is VLIW? You already know the concepts, right? A very long instruction word consists of multiple independent instructions or operations packed together by the compiler. And packed instructions can be logically unrelated. That's the key difference from SIMD. You can think of SIMD as packing instructions also, except they are operating on the same data. So the idea is the compiler finds these independent instructions and statically schedules them or bundles them, hacks them into a single VLIW instruction. And traditional characteristics of this is you have multiple functional units. Well, if you want to do this, you have to have multiple functional units. It makes no sense to pack multiple instructions together and have a single functional unit, right? That's not, that goes against balance design that we talked very, very early on. Uh, each instruction in a bundle is executed in lockstep Similar to SIMD, actually, right? similar to what we've seen. Uh, and this simplifies the hardware. This way, you can have very streamlined hardware. When an instruction stalls, everything stalls. It's like an in-order machine. You're, you're simplifying the hardware, and the compiler, it's the compiler's job to ensure that things do not stall. Right? And instructions in a bundle are statically aligned to be directly fed into the functional units. Again, this simplifies the hardware. This is similar to the lane concept, right? We have the lane concept in a SIMD engine. We have the lane concept in a GPU. As long as you're on your lane, well, you have to be on your lane, right? There's no other, <laughs> there's no other choice. Because the register that you're accessing, uh, the lane that you have to be on is determined by the register you're accessing. Here, again, the, hard, the compiler knows the structure of the machine very well. So the hardware can be designed such that you have a multiply unit here, you have an add unit here, and you have a load unit here, and you have a divide unit here. And the, it's the compiler's job to ensure that a multiply instruction doesn't go here. It goes here. And an add goes here, and a load goes here. And if there's no divide in that bundle, if there's another multiply, too bad. That cannot go into this. VLIW instruction, right? Even if it's independent. And now hardware is very streamlined because compiler already put these instructions such that it matches the hardware. The hardware doesn't need to have 
the crossbar going from this part of the machine to this part of the machine. The hardware knows that the compiler aligned the instructions such that the instructions that go to the functional unit, the instruction that needs the functional unit is at the same lane, if you will, with that functional unit. OK, so these are traditional characteristics. We want to simplify the hardware. And you've already seen this, so I'm going to skip this. We have IW versus SIMD. Uh, philosophy, if you look at this philosophy, this is very similar to RISC, right? Reduced instruction set computers. Remember from a long time ago, lecture two maybe? Uh, except, uh, basically, what's the concept? What's the philosophy there? You have simple instructions and simple hardware. It's the compilers. Software's job to exploit parallelism. And uh, John Cock was the initial proponent of this, an IBM 801 mini computer. Compiler does the hard work to translate high level language code to simple instructions, right? even control signals, and to reorder simple instructions to get the high performance. Hardware does very little translation and decoding. It's very simple. VLIW is Josh Fisher's uh, idea. And again, this is a recommended paper. It's a fun paper to read, as I told you earlier. Compiler does the hard work to find instruction level parallelism. And hardware stays as simple and streamlined as possible. It executes each instruction in a bundle in a lockstep. And basically doesn't need to do this routing across instructions. Whereas if you think of a superscalar processor, a superscalar processor, there is no restriction on where the instructions are, right? It just fetches n instructions. And it needs to figure out which functional units those n instructions need to go to. So a superscalar processor, if you look at this, uh, if you have the same structure, multiply, add, load, and divide, the divide can be here, multiply can be here, load can be here, add can be here. And the superscalar processor fetches this four instructions, and it needs to be able to route them to the appropriate functional units. Now you have a good idea of, well, I guess load happened to be lucky. And I guess I didn't. One, two, three, four. This makes no sense. OK, <laughs> there you go. That's better. <laughs> it's not an equivalent superscalar processor. That's the, that was the problem. So what you need to have is essentially a crossbar here or some kind of logic, whereas here it's very simple. Right? Of course, now it's the software's job to ensure that. OK, I'll give you the, uh, this is again from uh, Fisher's paper. But more formally, VLIW architectures have the following properties. There's one central control unit issuing a single long instruction per cycle. Each long instruction consists of many tightly coupled independent operations. Tightly coupled mean they cannot be broken. Uh, each operation requires a small, statically predictable number of cycles to execute. Now, this is the tough part, right? Well, first of all, small. <laughs> Second, is statically predictable. And we've seen many techniques in this course, like out of order execution, to overcome that statically predictable. And that's the downside of these architectures. Uh, you can see uh, the rest here. VLIWs have none of the required regularity of a vector processor or true array processor. And there's, if you read this paper, you'll see a lot of contrast between VLIW and SIMD architectures. And you see that there is no regularity needed here, right? There are different. Uh, there are different instructions operating on different data. OK. Uh, if time permits, we'll cover some techniques that uh, look at how, to, how uh, compilers actually schedule code. But I'll give you some history. Uh, there have been commercial VLIW machines. And unfortunately, they haven't been successful. It's not clear if they haven't been successful for technical reasons or other commercial reasons. But Josh Fisher, for example, started a company, Multiflow Trace. He actually designed 28 wide VLIW processors. Imagine packing together 28 instructions. There's no processor today other than regular SIMD processors that can do that many number of operations in parallel. You cannot imagine a 28 wide superscalar processor today, right? The widest superscalar processors today uh, are, I believe, IBM's processors, uh, and they're 8 wide. Uh, Bob Rao also designed uh, Sidrom, Sidro 5. Transmeta Cruzo, again, remember lecture three probably, uh, they translated x86 into internal VLIW operations. And they did not disclose the format of it. 
But this was, again, another uh, commercial machine. The most successful commercial machines actually have been in the DSP and embedded processor space. They have been employing VLIW for a while. Uh, and you may have programmed some of these machines. I'm not going to go into detail. Another example has been Intel IA64. Uh, this is Intel Architecture 64, or Itanium. Uh, this, is, this was not fully VLIW, but it was based on VLIW principles. Uh, it turned out that it became too complex. By, uh, so what the idea was to have instruction bundles, and instruction bundles actually specify the dependencies across instructions. So you could have these instructions here were not guaranteed to be independent, but if they were dependent on each other, the compiler actually specified what were the dependencies. And the hardware could use that information to stall as needed. So this way, so what, what problem does this solve? Well, uh, think about what happens if the compiler cannot find, in a, in a traditional VLIW machine, if the compiler cannot find independent instructions, what happens? Yeah, this is what happens, right? No ops. Whereas if you can do this, you get rid of some of these no-ops, right? Now you can say, oh, this multiply, the next instruction add is dependent. I'm going to put it in the same bundle, but I'm going to notify the hardware that it's actually dependent. And maybe the next multiply is also dependent on this add. I'm going to notify the hardware that this is actually dependent on the add. And maybe another, now you have another add here that could be independent. So you could actually bundle these two together. So now you have a VLIW instruction. I won't call it a VLIW anymore. It's really what Intel called it, EPIC, explicitly parallel instruction computing. Uh, that has dependencies. And now you've gotten rid of the no-ops. Your code is much tighter. Right? You can fetch this bundle. You know the dependencies. And you can execute it. The problem is now the hardware needs to check those bits that specify those dependencies. And the hardware is not as beautiful anymore, right? You cannot issue, multiply, and add at the same, in the same cycle. It's not VLIW anymore. It's based on VLIW. There's more information provided from the compiler to the hardware, but the hardware is not as beautiful, not as simple. That's the idea of IA64. You may have heard of that. Uh, and I think I've already told you this. Basically, how, you, how do you specify dependencies here? Well, you have a few bits in the instruction format that specify explicitly these dependencies. But now, again, you've lost some other beauty also, right? Which was with the VLIW, instructions directly go to the functional units. With EPIC, it's harder now, right? You issued multiply. Well, where do you issue the add? Well, I guess here. You are lucky. You have another multiply here. Well, you somehow need to route it there, right? So IA64 actually restricted the formats you can have such that this routing is minimized. I don't know if I have that slide, but actually, let me go and find it quickly. Not sure if we'll be able to get to it today, at least. Oh, there it is. Yeah, these are the IA64 uh, instruction formats. This is a VLIW instruction. It has three possible instructions. And they, uh, it contained two things, basically. It contained these stop bits, which is the boundary of independent instructions. So you can see the stop bits here. I believe these are stop bits. And uh, the instruction format also contained information as to which units the instruction should go to. So here, you have this instruction format template. Uh, the operation here can be a memory operation. The operations here can be in, uh, integer operations. So if you look at this, uh, there are multiple different formats. And the compiler needs to generate code that fits one of these templates. Does that make sense? So this, this gives you an idea, uh, at least, of uh, what the compiler needs to know about the underlying machine, right? 
That makes the hardware a little bit simpler, but it's not as simple as VLIW anymore because you have all of these different templates and the hardware needs to somehow decode these templates, right? So now your hardware is becoming much more complex. Okay. So that was IA64. Let's get back to where we were. Oh, I guess we'll get to that sometime. OK. So IA64 has not been successful also, at least as far as I know. Uh, Intel is still producing it, but at a, at a for a very small fragment of the server market. Uh, but it was a very good experiment, in my opinion. Uh, and I don't think we'll cover it, but if you take 740, uh, you'll, you'll learn more about it. So what are the trade-offs? Uh, what, what is the big advantage of VLIW? Not, not necessarily IS64. I've already given you this, right? <laughs> well, it's simple hardware, right? No need for dynamic scheduling. Uh, no need for dependency checking within a VLIW instruction. Again, simple hardware for multiple instruction issue. No need for renaming uh, if you want to extract uh, high performance. And no need for instruction alignment and distribution after fetch to different functional units, whereas a superscalar processor needs to have that. The disadvantages, well, you, you know very well. This is similar disadvantages to risk. Compiler needs to find n independent operations. If it cannot, it inserts no ops, uh, which leads to a parallelism loss and, and code size increase. Right? Because now in your code, you have no ops. You don't lose only parallelism, but you also increase your code size. Now, people have come up with smart way of encoding instructions, which I'll not go into detail, uh, such that no ops are encoded in instruction, right? You can encode how many no ops are coming afterwards and where those no ops are within this bundle. So that, such that you don't need to waste 32 bits for encoding a no op. So that, that you can get back the code size efficiency a little bit, but you still lose some. Another disadvantage is when you change the width, uh, like multi-flow, multi uh, for example, uh, Initially, the width of the VLIW machine was seven. It was a seven wide VLIW. And later, they developed machines that are 28 wide. When you make that change, now you need to recompile, right? In fact, anytime you change your functional unit organization, you need to somehow recompile. And that's another disadvantage. And you need to recompile for compatibility purposes. But uh, another reason is you, you want to get performance as well, right? Instead of finding seven independent instructions, you want to find 28 independent instructions now. So that's one big issue with VLIW engines. If you want to get good performance or even be compatible with the next generation, you need to recompile. Actually, you can fix the backward compatibility problem, right? A code, a code that's compiled for a seven-wide machine should hopefully be execute, able to execute on a 28-wide machine, VLIW. Basically, you just ignore those 21 instructions. But it would get horrible performance, right? At least compared to the code that's rewritten. And that lack of binary compatibility is another downside of uh, letting most of the things, most of the performance to be extracted by the compiler with a machine like this. And that has been the big advantage of out of order execution because it does all of this parallelism extraction underneath, right? At the expense of extra hardware. Okay. And superscalar processing also. Uh, lockstep execution caused independent operations to stall. Uh, basically, no instruction can progress until the longest latency instruction completes. That's another downside, which means that uh, the compiler needs to schedule code, and you've seen this problem before such that you can tolerate the latency of a load instruction, right? Except you don't know the latency of a load instruction dynamically, right? So how do you predict? How do you tolerate the load latency? Now you go back into, uh, do, you, do you actually design an out of order VLIW machine when you get to a load? And people have tried that. People have tried to do that in IA64, 
in itanium designs. It was very, very complex to do that because now you're, you're departing from the philosophy, right? Your philosophy is simple hardware. And if you're going to put back out of order execution, why did you start with VLIW to begin with? So it's very interesting to think about these execution models. And I'm giving you the high level trade offs, but you, you can actually imagine combining VLIW and out of order execution, right? They're not completely orthogonal. OK. Well, they're not completely orthogonal, but they're also uh, complementary. <laughs> OK, so summary, uh, to summarize, uh, VLIW simplifies hardware, but requires complex compiler techniques. Uh, and this is a solely compiler approach of VLIW. Uh, well, solely compiler approach to extracting high performance has some downsides that reduce performance. Uh, and I'll give you three of them. Uh, we've covered this uh, in different contexts, but you get too many knobs. If you cannot discover parallelism, you get no ops. Branch delay slot is another example, right? It's another example of uh, handling a performance problem solely at one level, which is a software level. Uh, now, it works very well for some cases, but it doesn't work uh, in general code, uh, general purpose code. Static schedule is intimately tied to the microarchitecture. In this case, you, you've seen that. Well, Epic kind of tried to fix it at the extra, extra complexity, but VLIW, your static schedule is tied to your functional unit organization, for example, uh, and your width, which means that code optimized for one generation performs poorly for next. And the last thing is no tolerance for variable or long latency operations, because you have lockstep execution. And if you want to get rid of that lockstep, you lose a lot of the benefits, which is this one. Right? OK, so these are the technical reasons why many of these machines have not been successful. But you could argue that they're, they, have, they have been, been successful for market reasons also. Right? So what, where, where has this been very, very successful? The LIW has been actually very, very successful in generating compiler optimizations. So compiler optimizations developed for the LIW architectures are actually employed in the compilers that you use today. Because they are useful for superscalar machines as well. If you figure out how to tolerate the load latency, if your compiler is able to schedule instructions such that you can tolerate load latency, you don't need to design a large instruction window, right? So using these optimizations are very, very useful. And they enable other co code optimizations as well. That's why I would like to cover those optimizations at some point this semester if we have time. And the second. Uh, place where LIW has been very successful is, is in embedded markets. And if you look at a digital signal processor by TI today, it does have VLIW instructions. OK, maybe we should take a break for three minutes before we jump into decoupled access execute so that you can, uh, you can think about this and maybe ask questions when we come back from the break. So let's get back around 149. All right, so we've seen uh, VLIW also. Uh, if you think of uh, out of order execution at one end of the spectrum, VLIW is on the other end, right? Out of order execution tries to do, out of order plus superscalar, I should say, tries to do parallelism extra extraction across instructions and tries to do multiple instruction issue all in hardware, right? Of course, it could be aided by some of the compiler optimizations uh, to make, uh, to tolerate some of the latencies. But VLIW tries to do everything in software, right? The hardware doesn't try to do any latency tolerance. Uh, but there's a spectrum between these two. There is actually a continuum. And the coupled access execute architectures fit nicely in that continuum. That's one of the reasons I would like to cover this. Uh, the idea here is, can we get some of the benefits of out of order execution, some of the latency tolerance benefits, without fully going out of order, without fully implementing Tomasulo's algorithm? which has a lot of overhead. And while potentially perhaps using a little bit help from the compiler as well. So we don't want full, we don't want every, all of the burden to be on the hardware, and we don't want all of the burden to be on the software either. And one way of doing this is decoupled access execute. And this was actually motivated by Tomozo's algorithm being too complex to implement in hardware. These were before the times when Intel actually implemented Pentium Pro, before the times uh, 
the high performance substrate that we talked about was produced uh, that described how to do out of order execution with precise exceptions. And the idea is very simple, as most good ideas are. Right? Uh, the idea is to decouple operand access or memory access and execution, ALU operations, via two separate instruction streams that communicate via ISA visible queues. So you have Two processors, actually these, they don't necessarily have to have two separate instruction streams, but initially when this idea was proposed, it had two instruction streams. You have one instruction stream that does the access, you have another instruction stream that does the execute. Access is load store. Execute is add, multiply, divide, increment. And whenever a load produces data, it pushes its data into this access to execute queue, and the instructions that need data from memory source that access to execute queue. So this is essentially a FIFO queue that the instructions can source. And the other way around also, when the execute processor generates an address, it pushes that address to uh, this execute to access queue, and when a load instruction needs that address, it actually can use that to uh, access memory. Of course, address computation, part of the address computation was done in the access processor also. Uh, these are, this e e execute, to a uh, execute to access queue was used mainly for data that's needed for stores. Make sense? So memory access in this processor, execute in this processor. The upside, well, now what you can do is, if you're stalled for memory access, the execute processor can go ahead, right? You can tolerate the memory latency that happens in the access processor by keeping this instruction stream busy. So you can generate the instruction stream that way. Or if you're bound by execution, the memory stream, uh, this, uh, you can tolerate the latency here. But that's usually not the case. <laughs> usually you're bound by memory in many, many programs. So that's the idea. It's a nice idea. It's simple, except it has some idiosyncrasies. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, Compile generates two instruction streams. This is from the paper uh, by Jim Smith uh, in ISCA 1982. And actually, this is from the journal paper, Transactional and Computer Systems. If you're interested in this, I'll, uh, I'd encourage you to read this. I don't expect you to know everything that happens here. But Compile generates two instruction streams, A and E, from the single instruction stream. And the, one of the idiosyncrasies is you need to synchronize the two instruction streams on control flow instructions, right? You have a branch who executes that branch. Well, you execute in one, but you've got to synchronize somehow. And that's what these queues were for. Access to execute branch queue and execute to access branch queue. Branches could be executed in both uh, streams. And sometimes it makes sense to execute the branch here, right? Because you load some data and you check. And sometimes it makes sense to execute the branch here. So if you look at this code, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is a single scalar code. You load some things, uh, and you use the results of the load for multiply operation here, two multiply operations, and you load something else, and use the results for another, I guess, addition operation here. And there's another multiply, and there's a branch. And if you look at the access code, loads are essentially, this is the address of the load, uh, uh, well, this is the base of the load, and this is uh, the index of the load, and this is the offset of the load, and the data goes into access to execute queue. And in the execute uh, code, the instruction that needs that data basically sources that access to execute queue. And these are FIFO queues, and the compiler orchestrates the management of those queues. Make sense? Now, the nice thing is, you can make these queues huge, right? Because there are FIFO queues, first in, first out. It's not like Thomas Sula's algorithm where you need to search. It's not a can, right? So this is a more scalable architecture from that point of view, and at least in hardware. Performance is a totally different issue. Right? OK, so what are the advantages of this? Well, I already told you the big advantage, right? Execute stream can run ahead of the access stream and vice versa. If a uh, if the access processor takes a cache miss, execute processor can perform useful work. 
if access processor hits in the cache, it supplies the data to the lagging execute processor. Queues reduce the number of required registers. So in each of these, you don't have as many registers. And you can scale this because this que these queues are relatively simple. Basically, what you get is limited out of order execution without the wake up and select complexity, right? without the tag broadcast, because the compiler gives you these who, who needs to source these queues. Mm. It's limited because you cannot, for example, do out of order execution within the execute stream. Although you could imagine that processor being an out of order processor to underneath, right? That's not how it was proposed. OK, what are the disadvantages? Well, now you need to compile support to partition the program and manage the queues. Right? This determines the amount of decoupling from the ac between the access and execute streams. And branch instructions require synchronization between the access and execute queues. And you have multiple instruction streams. That's a disadvantage, because somehow you need to form those multiple instruction streams and communicate between them. Although this can be done with a single one. In fact, uh, uh, one of the implemented uh, decoupled access execute processors, this one, it was a Stronautics ZS1 processor. And this paper describes how it operates. Actually, there are two papers that describe how it operates. It had a single instruction stream. You would fetch instructions, and uh, the processor would steer the instructions to these different access and execute subprocessors, if you will. Make sense? So you would basically. Uh, and th there were two pipelines, this pipeline, execute pipeline, and the access pipeline. And these, each, of them were, uh, each of them was in order, except they would slip. You could get out of order execution because they would slip compared to each other. I don't think I have uh, many more things to say here. I've given you the key idea. There are a lot of implementation details. And if you're interested in them, you can uh, read the papers. And you can see this processor also has the access to execute queues somewhere, if I can find it. There you go, execute data. And the address units have the queues. And the, oh, these are the registers, basically. These are the queues. And you could get data from different places. So this is the execute queue. And you could generate data that go into the access queue. OK, so how did they do instruction scheduling in this processor? Well, you would get both static and dynamic scheduling. Dynamic scheduling, uh, basically execute and uh, access streams are issued and executed independently, right? Because you have two separate pipelines for them. And that's how you get out of orderness. Each pipeline is in, or in order. Loads can bypass stores in the memory unit. So they would have load store reordering, part of the complexity in the out of order machine that we've discussed. And branches are actually executed early in the pipeline, because the branches are very important, right? You would like to resolve them quickly, because uh, they, both, uh, they, they affect, the, they affect uh, synchronization between these two streams. Because remember, uh, if you mispredicted a branch, you could be executing much farther in one of the streams, whereas you shouldn't be. This is the same problem with out of order execution, right? Whenever, or, or large instruction windows. You would like to be on the correct path when you're executing. And essentially, what you're having with two pipelines is a large pipeline, more instructions in the window. Uh, so the goal is to reduce synchronization penalty. Of course, this works only if the register a branch source is available. Right? So the branch problem is still here. Uh, but uh, the compiler that was used for ZS1 actually tried to eliminate that problem as much as possible. What they did was they moved compare instructions as early as possible before a branch, such that the branch source register is available when the branch is decoded. And because the branch decoder is right, uh, I don't know if it's here. Well, it's, yeah, it's not shown here. But the branch decoder is early in the pipeline. Uh, they would reorder code to expose parallelism in each stream. You need that to get high performance. And they would use loop unrolling to reduce branch count and to expose code reordering opportunities. Do you guys know about loop unrolling? Somewhat. I know one of you know because they, uh, you answered one of the questions on the exam with loop unrolling, which was actually a good answer. <laughs> but loop unrolling, the basic idea is this. You have a loop 
like this. Instead of having uh, a single iteration, you put multiple iterations together. Replicate the loop body multiple times within an iteration. Right. This is, uh, yeah, I guess you can read this, right? Instead of doing computation for AI and BI only within one iteration, you do AI BI as well as AI plus one, BI plus one. Right? So you put multiple iterations together. So what does this do? This amortizes the branching cost, right? Now instead of doing one branch every iteration, or one branch for 100 operations here, you do one branch for 50, or uh, that's right, you do, you do 50 branches here. Right? So the upside is this reduces loop maintenance overhead, uh, which is branching, as well as the induction variable increment here. You don't need to do that increment every time you execute the iteration. You do the increment, you amortize it across the number of times you need to do these calculations. Now you have a larger basic block. Right? If you look at this, instead of having, this is not three instructions, but instead of having three statements, you have one, two, three, four, five statements to optimize from. And you could reorder across those statements. Now the branches do not get in the way. The downside is, uh, there, there are two downsides here though, right? One is, somehow you need to detect that you're actually going to do this iteration, right? So what if you don't know your loop iteration count? Does that make sense? So you cannot apply this to every loop. If you apply this to every loop, you need to have some additional bookkeeping to figure out, are you actually doing, going to do this next iteration, right? Which is, are you actually going to execute this? Here, in this case, it's simple, right? Because you're checking while i is less than 100, and you're basically incrementing i. Initially, you can check whether i is even or odd, right? And do one iteration. If, if i is odd, you do one iteration, and then do the, the rest of the iterations this way. But it's not always that simple. Here, this, is, this is nice because this code is statically analyzable easily. Right. But it's not nice all the time. For example, let's say you're searching for a key in a linked list. How do you do this loop unrolling? Well, maybe you can think about that. So this is one of the uh, downsides. And you do increase code size because of that reason. Although you could reduce code size because uh, you could reduce the number of dynamic instructions executed and potentially the code size. Okay, any questions? This is just to give you an idea of how you can reduce those branch counts. And this uh, processor employed, this processor's compiler employed heavy loop unrolling to do that. And this is actually a technique that's used in many compilers to improve performance as well as enable code optimizations. Again, if we get to it, we'll see other ways of enlarging basic blocks. So here, your basic block is much larger. And you could imagine you having a basic block that's, that has 50 of these iterations, right? Now you can reorder code across all of those iterations without being constrained by branches. Okay, I guess in the, la in the next 10 minutes or so, let me cover systolic arrays also. Are you guys tired yet? <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> all right, I'll give you the basic ideas, not, not detail. Again, this is a totally different execution paradigm. It's exciting, well, partly because it was developed at CMU, Carnegie Mellon, and it has been very uh, influential over the design of specialized processors. Uh, and the idea is, uh, at a high level, I believe I have given you this idea, right? You could weave a, weave a computer system uh, as, as human body, right? You basically have data, you, if you, you, you take data elements, from memory, and you feed it to functional units. And one of the issues is, you don't want to do this, you don't want to uh, take one data element from memory, do some operation on it, and write the result back. Because this requires a lot of memory accesses. If you can take one data element and do many, many processing, many, many operations on that data element, you reduce the number of times you access memory. Right? And that's the idea. You basically have data flowing through memory in a rhythmic fashion, and we'll see how, what that rhythmic fashion is. Uh, it passes through many processing elements before it returns to memory. 
before you write back the result to memory. So it's similar to an assembly line, uh, except it's a little bit different. Uh, I guess I'll give you the example here. It's probably easier to look at here. So instead of having this, you have one processing element, you access memory, and write the result back to memory, and fetch the data next, and write the result back again, and fetch the data next, and write the result back again. You could view, uh, you could do, you could string together processing elements. You fetch one data element, pass it to the next processing element, pass it to the next processing element, pass it to the next one, pass it to the next one, pass it to the next one, and once you produce the data, you write it back to memory. That's the idea. And the analogy, uh, when H.T. Kong actually uh, designed these architecture, the analogy he had was memory uh, as a heart pumping data into the processing element, and processing elements are cells that are processing data. Right. Now you can uh, pump the blood or data into the processing elements, and the blood can circulate along different processing elements and change over time as it circulates. I'm being very high level. But why does this make sense? Well, uh, I guess I'll give you one example. Uh, when, you do, when you're doing convolution, which is very fundamental in many operations, filtering, pattern matching, correlation, or polynomial evaluation, and many image processing task, tasks, things operate very similar to what I've shown you here. If you don't believe me, this will show you that. So what is convolution? Basically, given a sequence of weights, this is your weight vector, and an input sequence, x, you compute a result sequence that's defined by this. Right. You guys have taken EE classes where you did convolution? Yeah. That's essentially uh, an expression of the convolution here with the weights and the input vector. And if you look at this, uh, you could, basically what we're doing is, we're doing the same computation, which is addition and multiplication, on different data elements. And the data elements uh, can flow, and you can compute each of these results based on that flow of data. So y1, for example, is w1x1 w plus w2x2 plus w3x3. Right. And if you look at this, you could pump in x1, x2, and x3, or the x vector inside. And it can be reused for the computation of different y elements. So basically, to compute each y, you don't need to bring in the weights as well as the x vectors separately over and over. Instead of doing that, you pump in the x vector inside, and you have these elements that store the weights and that generate the y vector and pump out the y vector. Make sense? This is an alternative to computing this first, which requires bringing in the x vector once and multiplying it with the weights. And then next, if you do the computation of y2, you need to bring in x vector again. If you need to do the computation for y3, you need to bring in the x vector again, dot, dot, dot. Instead of doing that, bring in the x vector once and compute y1, y2, the y vector in parallel and pump out the data. So to be able to do that, you need this unit that is very simple. If you look at this, this takes one element of the x vector, uh, produces the next element uh, by basically x out is the same as x in. It passes the data, passes the element, except y out is y in plus weight times x in. And if you do the computation here, you will see that so you've pumped in the data. Let's take a look at this element here. Uh, every clock cycle, you pump in one element of x, and you pump out one element of y. So this is the input part of the uh, systolic array, and this is the output part of the systolic array. Uh, and imagine that you pumped in x1. This is the cycle where x1 arrives as end of uh, the end element. And what happens here is, this element computes uh, x1 times weight 1 and assigns that to y1, right? So y1 is x1 plus w1 here. 
and then y1 flows this way in the next cycle. And in the next cycle, you have x2 here, right? So y1 was w1 x1. In the next cycle, y1 will be computed by w1 plus x1 plus w2 plus x2. Right? So you get that result back here. In the next cycle, you'll have x3 here. So y1 was w1 plus x1, w plus x2, which is here. So you'll add to that w3 plus x3, because x3 is in this input. And then y1 will be output that way. In the meantime, you've computed other things also here, right? Well, in the next cycle, y2 will come here, and you'll, you'll be computing on y2. So that's the idea. It's pretty simple. Uh, and you could, it could be very powerful. Uh, especially for specialized computations like this. So let's get back. So what is the principle? What we've done is we replaced a single processing element that did one of those computations only with a regular array of processing elements that carefully, and we carefully orchestrated the flow of data between these processing elements. You have to do that. Right? You have to somehow orchestrate uh, how inputs come in and how outputs go out. Actually, in this figure, if you look at this, you cannot pump in x every cycle. Right? You have to pump in x elements every other cycle. And I'll let you figure out why. Because by the time uh, you have one cycle in which x1, y1 is computed here with this, uh, in the next cycle, you don't want x2 to move here. Right? You want the result uh, of, of this element to be available such that you can add x2, uh, the second input uh, to that in this element. Make sense? So you need to carefully orchestrate the flow. You can get rid of that uh, downside. You can actually pump in data elements by pipelining, multiply, and add. And I will not go into that detail. But that's, uh, that's one of the downsides of this architecture also. You've got to carefully orchestrate the flow. But if you do that, if you can do that, you can achieve high throughput without increasing memory bandwidth requirements. You can do many operations for a given data element that you bring in. Uh, so what's the difference from pipelining? You could, you could argue that this is actually pipelining. It is pipelining, except it's very specialized, right? Your pipeline stages, if you will, are very specialized. They're doing specialized computation. And it's not, uh, what you're doing is really uh, not instruction execution. You're not pipelining the instruction execution. You're pipelining different operations. So at some level, it's pipelining. But it turns out you can have different array structures. You can have nonlinear or multidimensional array structures. If you're doing image processing, for example, uh, in fact, these processors have been used for image processing. Should be able to reach these things, right? There you go. Let's say you're adding uh, two images. You can actually have, let's say you're computing the average, for example, uh, or zooming in uh, to uh, an image. What you can do is you can feed in the x vectors as well as the y vectors, the pixels, that way. And you can have elements that compute averages. And these are actually multidimensional. So it's two-dimensional in this case, right? It doesn't need to be linear. So you could get inputs from this side, inputs from this side, in fact, inputs from this side also to compute an average and generate a result. Right. So it's a powerful idea that uh, has enabled a lot of image processing tasks to uh, execute really fast. And the connections can be multi-directional. I've, uh, I've given you one example of that. And they can be of different speeds as well. And in fact, you could generalize this idea. These processing elements don't need to be as specialized as what I've shown you here. This is very, very specialized, right? It computes only one thing. But you could actually have them execute kernels. You could have a program executing there. Right. Now it's becoming interesting, right? It's becoming more general purpose. OK, I think I'll skip this one. But you can add more programmability. You can store multiple weights. In, the, in, the, in each processing element. And you can select the weights on the fly depending on what happened to the data in the previous element. Right. 
That way, you can do a lot of filtering as the data passes the elements. Uh, and if you read that paper, it talks about how to do adaptive filtering based on what other data elements are, are coming from different uh, processing elements here. So take this further. Each processing element can actually have its own data and instruction memory. Uh, data memory can store partial or temporary results and constants. And if you take this even further, if you imagine a little bit more, this leads to stream processing or pipeline parallelism. So I'll give you the basic idea of that too. Uh, what is pipeline parallelism? This is actually one, uh, a programming model. Uh, you can take a look at this loop here. You have uh, a loop, and you can think of this loop as different stages. You do some operation uh, in stage A, some operations in stage B, some operations in stage C. Normally, with a single processor, the way this loop executes is uh, it's serial, right? But assuming the operations over here are not, uh, uh, so what, what, what may happen is you may have dependencies between AI, BI, and CI, but each instance of AI could be independent, and BI could be independent, and CI could be independent. So you could parallelize these loop, this loop by staging the execution of these three stages, or, uh, well, pipeline stages. So all instances of A can execute on processor 0. All executes, uh, instances of B can execute on processor 1. And all instances of C can execute on processor 2. Now what is the upside you're getting here? Basically, now you parallelize your execution. You fine grain parallelize the loop. And what might happen is these A's may be operating on the same data working set. So you preserve locality within the A's. And so uh, you can preserve locality within the B's also, and you can preserve locality within the C's too. So what you've done is you've pipelined the execution of A0, B0, C0, A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2. And we're executing different iterations in parallel at any given point in time. Make sense? So it's very similar to something like this. Well, something like this. Except the elements you have here are more programmable. Right? What you're having is a pipeline parallelism. You have, you're, you're having a systolic array. Right? Well, what are the inputs to the array? Well, the inputs are actually whatever inputs come into the loop. And you could pump, pump those inputs into that pipeline. OK. Well, one example, one concrete example of this pipeline is file compression. Right? You can have an input file, and you can stream those inputs. You can design a processor that looks like this, in fact. Uh, you can stream the inputs coming from a file, and they can go through these different stages. I'm not going, go, going to go into these sta uh, stages, because we do not have time right now. But basically, you can specialize each of these stages such that, for example, this compression is a specialized processor. The, the allocation is a specialized processor. And what uh, we're basically, you can think of this as a systolic array. Or you could think of this as a programming model. You have different cores doing these different functions, except you preserve, uh, you get the data, pump it in, and pump the data out. So you do a lot of operations on the same piece of data element. OK, so let's conclude with this. What are the advantages of this? Well, we're making multiple use of each data item. This reduces the need for fetching and refetching every single data item over and over. That convolution example should uh, give you a good example of that. You get high concurrency because you're doing different things on the same data item at uh, different times. And you have very regular design. Both data and control flow is very, very regular. The disadvantages, well, this is the disadvantage with many regular designs, right? Not good at exploiting irregular parallelism, right? How do you do irregular parallelism here? Well, your processing elements need to be able to handle irregular parallelism. Right? It's relatively special purpose because of this reason. It needs software programmer support to be a general purpose model. I guess I'll uh, keep you here for a couple of minutes, but the, the warp computer was the first instance of a systolic array that was developed at CMU during this time frame. And it was used for many image processing tasks within and outside CMU. 
It has a linear array of 10 cells, and each cell is a 10 megaflop programmable processor. And it was attached to a general purpose host, ma host machine. So you could think of this as the GPUs of its time, right? And I'll give you a picture of this. Basically, uh, uh, Kung's group designed a high level language and an optimizing compiler to program the systolic array. It was used to accelerate vision and robotics tasks. And this is what it looked like from this paper over here. Uh, well, you had this warp processor array. And this is what it, each cell in this processor, and remember that there were 10 cells, uh, each cell looked like. It's very simple, but it did accelerate uh, these image processing and vision and robotics tasks a lot. And I'll let you uh, read the paper if you would like to know exact numbers. But I'll leave you with this food for thought. What is the difference between systolic arrays and SIMD? There's a big difference, but they're both regular designs. And they're both very, very useful for image processing tasks, for example. But one is a lot more specialized. I think, I believe systolic arrays are a lot more specialized than SIMD. Uh, but I'll let you think of other differences related to programming model architecture, how to exploit regular parallels. OK. That's all I have. I have an announcement. Yes, there you go. There's actually a three-way tie for third place for the extra credit. Um, the other contestant was Andrew Piper, so he'll also be receiving this credit. OK, that's good to know. And also, please pick up the homework. Yeah, there are your homeworks in the front. And if you don't pick, up, uh, pick them up today, you can pick them up on Friday, too. <laughs>